Hi, everyone. My name is Jody Pierce. I'm a college student studying fashion design, environmental sciences, and chemistry. I run cross country and track at a division one level, and I am obsessed with change. The thoughts I want to share with you today are twofold. First, I'm going to tell you about the little bit that I know about changing the world as a young person. And then I'm going to tell you about how I applied that to my industry, the fashion industry, and became something that I call a fashion scientist. All my life, I've been a happy, curious child who turned into a relatively happy, curious young adult. But all my life, I've struggled with finding this omniscient, bigger purpose that, once found and developed, I knew would provide me eternal happiness and sense of self. I've always known I can change the world, and I see so much injustice and inequality. And yet, every day, I am stumped by how to solve it or even where to begin. So when I'm done with my classes and my practices and my clubs and my homework, I oftentimes find myself back at my college apartment typing the same words into my Google search bar. How to change the world. Now, let me be clear, Google did not have the answers, no matter how many times I tried. But over time, I did learn this. The biggest ideas often boil down to the simplest concepts. And this is no different. To change the world, we have to first be cognizant of its problems. I was heartbroken for a long time before I was motivated because I was curious long before I was a leader. In terms of fashion, this meant analyzing the system and asking questions about it. How was fabric made? Who sewed my clothes? And where at? And because I was curious, I learned that most clothes are made by severely underpaid laborers, working in oftentimes unsafe conditions. While the textile industry itself is the number one industrial polluter of fresh water, and the synthetic fabrics that make up the vast majority of our clothing, doubtless including much of what we are all wearing today, are the single largest source of microplastics in our oceans. And I was shocked, because everyone wears clothes, and no one ever thinks twice about it. This made me sad, and then it made me mad, and finally, it made me motivated. When I realized that this was something I could have control over, that I could help people suffer less, I started to take action. But it all started with being curious about the world, its people, and the interactions we all share. Now, after you become curious and consequently sad and mad, you have to funnel that into something. Which brings me to my second point, being a leader. Now, I know we hear this all the time, but I've sat in rooms full of leaders, brimming with supposed leadership. And we still weren't able to speak up, say our ideas and opinions, and represent those we were supposed to represent. I think this is because, for a long time, it felt like nothing was good enough. If I wasn't making a big enough difference, or it wasn't perfect, then it wasn't worth it. And I watched nothing change. Until finally, I decided that no matter how little of a difference I made, or how big I messed up, I had to try. It all comes down to risk. Risk looking like an idiot, risk what other people think of you, the risk of failure in order to create any change. That's a chance that we have to take. Earlier this semester, I sat in a class full of Division I student athletes. It was a leadership class full of students who were to become the leaders and captains of our college sports teams. During a personality quiz, our professor asked us if we did our schoolwork because we enjoyed learning. Her question was met with unenthusiastic responses, shakes of heads, laughs of disbelief. And I sat there astonished because we are paying God knows what intuition to study literally something that we choose. This is one of the first major choices we make as young adults, and it is one deeply rooted in passion. So why weren't my peers pursuing something that they loved? Because we either never bothered to find out what we love, or we are too scared to go after it. And that brings me to my third point. For a couple years now, I've been living by the phrase, I don't do things because I want to. I do things because I'm scared to. That's the story of how I got up on this stage, giving this talk to you all. I've confessed my feelings for people and gotten entirely rejected. I've applied to jobs I was totally unqualified for. And I've ran in races I probably wasn't fast enough to be in. 
True liberation is when we don't let these things control our lives. Now, how does that relate to changing the world? I learned that fear is tied directly to passion. So if you can find what breaks your heart, sets your soul on fire, that's probably a good place to start. For me, as I've mentioned before, it was fashion. Ever since first grade, I wanted to be a designer. As I got older, though, I started questioning if that was the right choice for me. What if I didn't get a job or make enough money? Those were my parents' concerns. And how could I support an industry that so blatantly destroyed the environment and exploited labor at every stage of the process? Those were my concerns, and they broke my heart. So I started doing my research, and I learned about the future of sustainable fashion and decided that I would become an advocate for the confluence of fair labor and innovative design. Now, just like typing into the Google search bar, how to change the world, there are no immediate answers. I would have to find them on my own and with the help of those around me, which is how I started thinking like what I call a fashion scientist. The combination of chemistry, biology, sustainability, and design has captured my attention like nothing else. And the world of science-based fashion is slowly unfolding in a long process of trial and error. Over this past summer, I conducted an experiment out of my college dorm, synthesizing microbacterial-based leather using vinegar, glucose, and a colony of bacteria and yeast. The byproduct of this solution can be harvested and dried out to produce a biodegradable version of leather. I experimented dyeing the solution to produce variants of this leather, and I researched startups working on a larger scale who can produce whole garments from this method. From an environmental standpoint, the goal is to create a cyclical fashion system in which the textile is produced in-house, eliminating the need for the mass consumption of water for the growing of crops, the use of toxic chemicals, the exploitation of field laborers, and the contamination of water from dyeing factories, with the garment ready to biodegrade at the end of its life cycle. It's time for fashion to get a makeover. The way we have created textiles has been the same since the very beginnings of time, and innovation has yet to catch up with the industry. But I know that I can help change this, and I know that in your fields, industries, and lives, if you can find what truly breaks your heart, we can be leaders and do the things we are scared to do. Remember that no one else knows how to do these things yet either. There is no guidebook. Google doesn't have the answers. But there is an answer, and it's us. We are the generation that becomes the world's future role models. I believe in us. Thank you.